Welcome to Laser Radio. I'm Brad Soner. This episode is brought to you by the new Laser Bullet Helmet. The perfect combination of aerodynamics and ventilation, the bullet is designed with a narrow front profile and smooth top section with minimal venting for maximum aerodynamic benefit. The air slide system allows for ventilation on demand with quick and easy adjustment of the front vent cap. Compatible with both the Laser Life Beam Integrated Heart Rate Monitor System and the Laser Inclination Sensor Position Monitor, the bullet is available in both standard and MIPS versions. In stock and available now, visit your local Laser dealer for more information on the Laser Bullet. Welcome back to Laser Radio. On our last episode, you heard Michael Eisner, the director of the original Coors Classic and, uh, well, formerly the Red Zinger that then became the Coors Classic Bicycle Race. In the last episode, we were talking about some of Michael's favorite courses. We started to move into some of the favorite riders that uh, he had brought over for the race because I think this was one of the really important things of the Coors Classic was pitting the best Americans against the best in the world. And that was something that, Michael, you really focused on in terms of building this race. You were talking about the criteriums up at North Boulder Park, uh, Jacques Boyer lapping the field. Anyone who was everyone in cycling raced at the Coors Classic at some point. Was there ever a rider that you didn't get? Was there ever uh, someone on your list that, that never came over? Good question. Um, who didn't I get? You know, I think that the plum for me was Bernard No, five-time winner of the Tour de France. Um, and, you know, we had so many of the greats that competed here. And I'm going to say I think I got all of them. Every one that I had really wanted to try to get. Yeah. You know, once we decided that the that the Soviets were in our crosshairs and they eventually came over here, the next thing was to try to get Bernardi No here. Because the match that was made in heaven that everybody in the world wanted to see was Eno versus Sergei Sukaruchinkov. Yeah. And by the way, I can still spell his name. <laughs> S-O-U-K H O U R T C H E N K O V. Well, I'll check that after the show. I'm going to spell check you on it. Uh, don't. So um, they came over with the 1980 Olympic gold team and competed against Eno, and it was just glorious. And in Young Le Monde, um, we made a great movie that year, had it narrated by um, Jim McKay, who did all of those years of ABC Wide World of Sports and the Olympic Games. And I just called him up one day and I said, I got $5,000 for you to narrate this thing. Will you do it? And he said, sure. I flew to New York and he sat in the studio. Cool. And, you know, it was, it was again our attempt to try to get mainstream sports to rub off on this on cycling, mm-hmm. which which was always considered a secondary sport, and to get network TV connected with this sport was was a real challenge. I mean, I went there when it was the Red Zinger, and I had you know network guy after network guy in New York tell me no, and finally I got one to articulate why the no, and he said we can't cover it. You can't do this from a helicopter. We don't see their faces. The the motorcycles that we see in the European coverage are all behind. We don't see the racers. We don't really, uh, we're not close. We're not intimate. We can't cover it well. And I took that as a real challenge. I kind of said to him, I hear you. Instead of being all defensive about it, I came back, went to BMW of North America, convinced them to give me a very expensive high-end motorbike, I then went to the world championships in Czechoslovakia where they had a reverse swivel seat motorcycle and they had a place that had a deck off the back left-hand side for camera equipment, for all the batteries to go, a little storage area for all the tapes to go. It's like, dude, we got to do this. This is the answer. This is how I'm going to get my networks. Took a bunch of snapshots, came back to the States, um, went and got the 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 this is going to sound alien to you, but got the prints um, processed down at the local drugstore. 
<laughs> just poking fun at the millennial. And um, then we uh, took them to the network and said, this is what we're going to do. And they said, well, you show it to us when it's done. And we had a fabricator put together this magnificent motorcycle. And I went back and I slapped down uh, a photograph of the motorcycle. And he said, you know what? This is the fourth time you've been in my office. Let's do this. And it was, you know, CBS. Yeah. This was CBS Sports. And they sent their top producers out here. And they did the live. They did North Boulder Park last five laps live. And they did a wraparound with, you know, John Tesh and David Michaels. And covered the race with the Soviets and Alexi Graywall. It was this dramatic coverage with this John Tesh written script and his, you know, music because he was a Juilliard school of music guy and did all the soundtrack work for the Tour de France coverage they did later on. So he emerged, you know, in terms of his own capability of not just being a sports announcer, but also doing the soundtrack for it and writing. And he did this wonderfully dramatic writing because he too didn't come from cycling right. so it wasn't about this guy attacking and somebody staying on his wheel they didn't talk like that to the public they talked about the fact that this guy's low on water and that if he doesn't have it that water's the thing that's going to get him to the finish line and if he doesn't have it he can't because there's you know 17,000 feet of climbing in this bike race day after day the arduous grind of these athletes out there it was that kind of a dramatic approach to taking this thing to the public at large. What, what is the modern American bike race missing? I mean, why, why can't we get back to that? I, I'm sure you were part of bringing back the, the most recent race here in Colorado. Um, but w what are we missing today? Why can't we get back to those course classic days? I'm going to say that there is, um, and, 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 and I need to be cautious about this I, I, because I, I, the races are so extraordinary. They look so good. You look at a finish line now and there's just nothing better. They're running great, safe races. Medalist sports has just, you know, my fingers and toes are crossed, but they've done decades of safe bike racing in America. It's extraordinary. And, you know, I'd love to say that, you know, one of the, the, the primaries in that organization, you know, cut his teeth at the Coors Classic with us and our construction crew. And I'm very proud of the fact that Jim Burrell, in fact, did do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and for those not familiar, Medalist is basically a, an event company. So you, that's right. you want to start a race. You hire Medalist to come in and do the logistics. They uh, tour of California, tour of Georgia, tour of Missouri, pretty much any big bike race in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, has been run by medalist. That's right. Um, another group on the East Coast, G4 Productions, has done um, a magnificent job. They pay attention to a lot of the kinds of right stuff that I think are really important for promoters to keep track of. You know, part of it is just making something that's completely exciting for media to cover. So you have to really, there's a guy in, in England who um, had the best name for his sporting company. It's called Made for TV, hmm. Sports Made for TV. It isn't that the event was modified for TV. It's that they paid attention to the fact that the thing had to be televisable. Once it was, and it was telegenic, using a lot of old terms here, but once it was, then your ratings existed, your sponsors existed, your teams came, your crowds came. It's, it's exponential the way it grows if you pay attention to the right things. But you've got to have great elements. You've got to have great competition. And I think some of the things I will blame on the races themselves in terms of their contact with the media and with the spectators. But another piece of this also are the athletes. Yeah. For some reason, we seem to have a breed of athlete back then that was more, we had more of the Peter Sagans than we have today. You can't just have one Peter. You've got to have two if they're going to mouth off at each other right. or they're going to have some kind of flair for each other that needs to be competitive. And yes, we have that in the sprinters environment at the Tour de France and they're knocking each other down and we watch TV for that. But, you know, um, some of the people that we have at the top of our sport are not very flavorful. We have a lot of um, 
We don't have a lot. I'm going to phrase it another way. We don't have a lot of ethnic diversity, which I think would would be extraordinarily helpful in our sport. Um, Chris Carmichael and I, who uh, you know, Chris worked with with uh, that L.A. guy. Um, he won for, a few tours for years. Who who uh, at the time won a few tours. Um, so Chris Carmichael is head of the Cycling Federation, and he came up with an idea. Let's go down to the Native American Sports Camp and see if we can, you know, have a, a cycling sector down there and recruit some of these Navajo kids and others that have a different bar mm-hmm. for a threshold of pain than the white kids growing up in the suburbs of you know of yeah. of Detroit. And we went down there and we found these kids. They were awesome. There was no conversion to bring them into the sport. But I think there was an attempt by people like Butch Martin and others to want to bring some people into the sport that, you know, could add a new dimension to it, a, 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 a flavorful dimension. A Nelson Vales, a personality that's bigger than life. Uh, a Davis Finney, bigger than life personality. We had a lot of those. And Davis would get off his bike and yell at people and point his finger, yeah. and he would have these 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 you know, venge, vengeful you know things. And the more the more rivalries that I could create for him, yeah. finding you know Alan McCormick, this little Irish guy who came over here and kicked butt on criteriums, um, you know this giant uh, Dutch guy Michelle Zanoli. There was many of these guys that we brought over deliberately to try to foil. This Canadian Steve Bauer, who was constantly finishing second to Davis. But I didn't want Davis to just walk away with everything. He was the all time winner of all medals at the Coors Classic. Only his wife, uh, Connie Carpenter, had as many as Davis. But, you know, rivalries were a critical part of that. And our job as promoters were to build the rivalries, to hand them to the press, yep. to pit these guys against each other. It's boxing, Brad. It's the kind of thing you see when you see half of planet Earth tuned into a boxing match. You have to be there. Can Davis win again? Can Connie win again? What about Jeannie Longo? What about Maria Canines, this Italian woman that's come over who's quiet, sitting in the corner but beating Connie? What's up with that? Yeah. It's those kinds of things that create momentum that have you lean forward that you're attracted to and that look good on television it's hard to replicate that now the the growth of cycling over the last 20 years has almost had this adverse effect on uh, races like the like the u.s stage race because now there's so many options for the teams and riders and we don't get the same fields everywhere you know in the course classic days we knew who the the big names were and there there you know was really no other option there was no saving your legs for preparation for you know now they're on these training programs trying to target whatever grand tour they're doing and you know maybe they don't want to come over for a week in colorado or a week in california so it's hard to get the 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 same athletes and and build those rivalries it's almost yeah the the sport has grown so the calendar at least has grown so big and so international uh, it's hard to get everyone together in yeah. one place now. It's almost. I remember having this conversation with Dave Chauner. Dave produced um, the event. He was my first mentor and first announcer here at the yeah. Red Zinger Bicycle Classic. And Dave um, ran the Philadelphia race, which was the longest standing one day in America, 31 years until it ended just last year yeah. and maybe rekindled at some point or another. But, you know, Dave was always worried. He's like, I got to get LeMond. I got to get, you know, s- name him, Lance whoever it was at the time that was big. And I kept saying to him, I want your race to be bigger than any individual athlete. Because if you deliver that racer this year and they're not back next year, then the news is always asking, why weren't these guys back? And the race feels deflated. I wanted the race to be great. Maniunk to be the greatest climb in, in America or one of the best in the world, to have its own flavor, its own personality. And we really succeeded in doing that in Philadelphia. He ran a magnificent race. Because it wasn't top heavy. Sure, the first year, who wins this thing out of nowhere? Eric Hyden. Five gold medals in the Olympic game in speed skating. Could not have been a better gift to give to Dave from a media perspective. But I kept that in my head, too, all those years. The race needs to be bigger than any single athlete. Because if they don't come back, I don't want this race to not be the race it once was. I think America learned that very valuable lesson after 
several Tour de France's or Tours de France were won by a certain cyclist out of Austin, Texas. We, <laughs> we, we learned what happens when we you know, yeah. focus on just one athlete. Yeah. Uh, yeah, humans are fallible, but the Manny Young wall never never makes a mistake, you know. The Manny Young wall has never sued anybody. Or no. No, magnificent. Drugs. And we had our suicide hill in snow mass. We had the great climbs that took place out in California. Um, I remember one time um, meeting up with uh, Robin Williams, and I remember him kind of coming up to me. It was at a bike race. It was the San Francisco Grand Prix, and Robin was invited. And he came up on stage, and he gave me the crooked finger, come over here. And I came over, he said, I just want to let you know that the first bike race I ever saw was the Coors Bicycle Classic, and it's so cool to meet you. It's like, Robin, are you really saying that to me? You got to be kidding me. I said, what's the story? He said, I was up on Trinity grade outside of Santa Rosa or wherever, wherever he was at the time. And he said, these guys were down there with chalk and they were writing names on the road. It's like, what was that? He said, I came down there and I was up in the bushes and I saw the race go by. Little did we ever know that Robin Williams was like right up there watching this race. And he said, I fell in love right there. And at that point, he said, I want to tell you, I have 32 bicycles. Yeah, I was going to say, he went on to build a massive bike collection. Showed up at the Tour de France. Yeah. We, we bumped into him again at the Tour year after year. Um, that's right. So we, I love the fact that that was that kind of rub off and yeah. that this race was responsible for, for lots of guys. You know, about four years ago, Alan Lim came to me. Now, Alan is a guy who runs a company called Scratch here in Colorado. But he is one of the top physiotherapists, top physio doctors, coaches in the world, I think, for my money, right? And he worked with Lance for many years on nutrition and that kind of thing. And then he created this wonderful product called Scratch, um, spelled with a K. Um, And Alan came to me and he showed me a photograph. And it's this Filipino kid standing there with a couple of other Filipinos looking people. And there was the Reno Coors Classic banner behind him. And I said, what is this? He goes, that's me. I'm going, you're kidding me. You're, you're like 14 yeah. or 13. First race I ever saw. It's where I fell in love. Was right there in Reno. And he's become an important, real fixture piece leg, legend yeah. in the sport of bicycle racing. I love that It's got to be cool for you to you know to follow those stories. Like you talked about Greg LeMond coming in, uh, racing as a junior in the, the, the first episode. You know, you saw him go from this junior kid who had to, pull out of the race early because they didn't want the kid racing too much to a Tour de France winner. And there's dozens of those stories that came out of the Coors Classic. You follow all those people. I mean, you, you've stayed in touch with those people throughout, throughout their careers. And, uh, it must be amazing now to look back and see all the dots that were connected through the Coors Classic. There's an additional piece of reward for me that is beyond the legacy of this race that has, you know, gone deep. And that is this thing we call race babies. Those were kids who were born as the result of their parents yeah. having met at the Coors Classic. We've identified 32 of them <laughs> at the Red Zinger or Coors Classic. Uh, Taylor Finney is yeah. a race baby. Yeah. Peter Stetna is a race baby. Yeah. Um, Bo Nickman is a race baby. So they're all over the place, and I love them. And they come stay at my house, and we hang out, and I just admire these kids from close up and afar as being these human living legacies yeah. of the bike race, not just some great memory or videotape piece of something that happened. 32 race babies. It's been a sexy race you guys were running. Your partner all of those years, uh, David Toll, yeah. showed up in our bike race office when he was probably 14 or 15 years old, and he wandered in one day, this brash uh, kid, just saying, you know, I want to fold envelopes or do whatever yeah, I can. Put me to work. Put he me was in completely coach. energetic and just put me to work, right? And so then he ended up being kind of an assistant, you know, carrying bags, going to the airport and picking up the Soviets when they arrived here. And uh, he, you know, that's where he started. And then we handed him a microphone when we did this project called Cyberbike. And off he went from there and being a great bike race announcer. So those are the legacies that for me are just the kinds of things that I just make me sleep well at night. I want to talk about Cyberbike real quick because I think it was way ahead of its time. Cyberbike was a touring product. Uh, you guys went on the road with Saturn, and it was basically uh, trainer racing, uh, like the the modern-day CompuTrainer, even Zwift racing. You had people on trainers, and 
you were at car shows and stuff like that? I was hired by General Motors um, and specifically the Saturn car division to Rest come in and, um, and, and help them with their sponsorships in sports. So because of my work with the Coors Bicycle Classic, I connected up with this group called the International Event Group, IEG, in Chicago. And sponsorship was something that was of real, real interest to me, a real intrigue. How to encourage a sponsor to be interested in, in a property and how to stay in the property. So one of the things that I talked to Saturn about early on was that they were going to these bike shows and they were taking Saturn bike racers and putting them at lunchroom tables and having them sign autographs and posters. And no one knew who they were. They were just this disconnected, disembodied table of athletes that, you know, were, who are they? They're doing what? Why are we signing these things? I'm taking them home to brag about them, but I don't know anything about them. So I came back to Boulder after one of those big oak room table uh, sit downs at General Motors, where they were kind of laying out for me some of their objectives. One of them is to how to make this work better at auto shows. And so I came back and created this attraction, which they then built and paid for, that had four stationary bike uh, stands and a monitor in front of each one of them and a huge monitor for the public because once again everything I do has to be for for the public and for spectators we would hire announcers who would scream and yell and you know call a race that's 35 or 40 seconds long and the courses were monumental animated world classic courses of something that might have been at the Coors Classic or one of the Saturn races we did a couple of Saturn races and so we would create these courses and regular people would queue up, sign a disclaimer, get up on the bikes, have one of the Saturn racers stand next to them, giving them tips oh, cool. on how to go beat their mate who's, you know, on the bike next to them. And we would do two ups or four ups. We would have little bikes for kids to get in there. And it was became one of the single most popular things in the entire auto show, not just in the Saturn booth, yeah. but I mean the entire auto show and people were coming from, you know, other major corporations coming over to us, guy from Mercedes Benz going, how can I have something like this? Because yeah. the people were queued up to participate while they were standing there waiting. We were talking to them about the product. Yeah, we were showing, there was a static car display with a bike rack on the roof. I created the uh, Saturn Cycling Magazine, which 400,000 copies got distributed with, with a little pullout tab that was an encouragement to test drive a car. They had 8,000 and test drives that materialized into 2,500 car sales. They could track it yeah. the whole way. 2,500 car sales. We were the largest dealer in the country, right? And we were the sporting event for Saturn. Yeah. So it was making the sport relevant and working with and in the context of some sport that they were working with. This great car with this great sport. And so Cyberbike was a part of helping make that work. It was a great, cool little attraction. Did you ever identify any talent from Cyberbike? We always hear about the, you know, the, the riders that were discovered on Zwift or they go to these, <laughs> these competitions. Was there ever anyone that was like, this person might actually have some chops? We had a. Uh, it's probably harder to trade show. They're probably all wearing. We had a little shoes. a little boy come up to us, and he had he was this little white boy, but he had this afro. With these blue eyes. I mean, he was just striking. You just look at him and go, what? Yeah. And he wandered up and he said, okay, I'm next. And I said, but dude, you know, your, two, your feet won't touch the pedals. I just happened to be working the bikes that day. I was with some other guys. He looks up at me and he puts his hands on his hips. And he goes, oh, yeah? Well, I'm five. And I said, hey, you guys, did you all hear that? He's five, man. Let's figure out a way to make this work. So somebody ran the pedals oh, while nice. he sat up there. He beat his dad, you know, and he just got off and he was <laughs> 900 feet tall. Yeah. That's my best story. Good. And another one was this guy named Floyd Landis who was sitting in a motorhome at the Tour of California back when he had just won the Tour de France, Mr. Cool. And um, someone challenged him to come over and race against him in cyberbike. So Floyd got up on cyberbike and wow. in his uh, cowboy boots and promptly lost. 
I'm sure he was super interested. I'm sure he gave it his best effort. You know what? He actually did yeah. with the guy. Well, here's the deal about Cyberbike, as you know, that big guys can push heavy watts right. for a very short distance. We made the race a very short distance, and this guy just, you know, yeah. blew, blew out flat. Not, not made for climbers. That's no. For sure. I mean, you take that thing over for the next three and a half hours, yeah. and Floyd Landis is still on the bike cranking at, you know, 400 watts, and this guy will be, you know, with his tongue hanging out, laying on the floor. Wow. So, yeah, we had a lot of fun with that project. And, I, again, what it comes back to is creating things that are relevant to people. The Saturn Cycling Magazine that I, that I told you about, we had Robin Williams on the cover of that. I begged Robin to do that. And he's on there with his goofy helmet talking about his bikes. We did this long, long interview with Robin and put it in there. And, you know, it wasn't – Eno wasn't on the cover – Merckx wasn't on the cover. Robin was on the cover. Why? Because I wanted this thing at Safeway. I didn't want it at Ed's Bike Shop. They needed to pick this up and see it and be somehow rubbed off onto cycling. So that thread really has gone its way through almost everything I've, I've worked on. Looking at racing now, do you, are, do you still watch races? I mean, are you, are you up at 4 a.m. to watch the, the European pirated feeds? What's your, what's your current... In status in in cycling yeah absolutely not yeah. um that's not what i do i've never enjoyed that kind of bike race coverage um i have long been an advocate of doing the same kind of coverage we did back in the course classic days and everybody feels like you know we've gone over the hump and we've gone too far now you've got to cover it from start to finish or kind of start to finish two hours into a six hour day so, and so we'll last we'll watch the last four hours of the race that's a hard argument to make that that you're giving people too much bike racing in the coverage today absolutely but there's also something to be said that who needs six hours of bike racing well you know? here's the deal in the six hours of bike racing there is an hour of extraordinary sport yep. that's but in there i was gonna say you right? know like just recently i think we've been seeing more races that are airing airing it from start to finish and everyone's talking about how great it is to see the breakaway form because normally you know, we, we pick up the coverage two hours in, the breakaway is away, they've got eight minutes, it's six guys, and they just list off the names. But yeah. seeing how that happened, how that breakaway formed, you know, all the constant attacks before and the chasing, and then eventually the split is made, and like, uh, you know, that's great action, but it's only 25, 30 minutes. And then once right. that breakaway is established, the the intensity of watching cycling as a as a spectator really goes downhill for yeah that's right so it, and, and it's you know it's the other parts of the sport that are also fascinating for me um, back in the Tesh Michaels days at the Tour de France we watched you know Greg LeMond um, get pulled back when he attacked Bernard you know his teammate um, who was about to win his fourth Tour de France at that point and you know the car pulls up and says Greg I don't care how you feel today get back there and protect Bernard. So we get to the finish line. Bernard at that point had crashed. His nose was bloody. Um, he had gone off to, you know, get cared for. And Greg LeMond is sitting there feisty mad, in tears, uh, in these kind of bleachers over on the side, and the camera's in his face. Yeah. And um, we would never have seen that in current coverage of bicycle racing. And you look at the stuff that happened here in Colorado where we sat there and had to watch, you know, an hour and a half of them climbing all the way up a couple of years ago in the U.S. Pro Cycling Challenge. We watched all of this. We handed to people on live television nationwide. Do you know that day we were beaten by women's softball? It's wrong. Don't do that. That race had the best finish in the world. Yeah. You, Brad, were at the top of Flagstaff Mountain, calling one of the greatest finishes of any bike race that's ever happened. And the majority of the race was live coverage of watching them do nothing yeah. for two and a half hours going up to the mountains, the same breakaway with the same break time the entire race until they hit the bottom of Flagstaff and the whole thing exploded with one of the the great finishes we've seen in a long, long, long time. That's wrong. We don't cut. Co we're covering the wrong part of it. The we're spending too much time. We're hand feeding audiences something. And I'm again, I'm talking about a mainstream sports audience, yeah. not us saddle sniffers, you know, who just want to, you know, sit there and watch crank by crank coverage. But one year I did a survey and I think this is really telling of all the, the 
Brad Soners and Dave Tolls and guys who work for the Federation and uh, racers themselves. And I said to them, do you have a DVR at home? Hands go up. When you're watching a Tour de France stage, how many of you are watching it on at least 2x, if not 4x or 10x, meaning yep. fast speed? Every hand went up. Yep. None of them are watching it in real time. If they had a DVR, they never didn't watch it that way. There were a few exceptions. Some of them said, I get up at 4 o'clock and watch it real. In real time, I don't have a DVR. And they watch all these feeds that you're talking about and, you know, yeah. Steep Hill or, you yeah. know, any of those ones. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm, I watch the Tour de France every single year and I watch every stage of the Tour de France mm -hmm. and I do watch it at 2X and 4X and I bring it to a halt when I see that there's a break or a moment that's going on in the sport and I just wish the coverage was different than what we have now and I have those arguments with those guys. I was a consultant to Universal Sports NBC for their first at least three years, a paid consultant for those guys, helping them try to figure out who should be on the desk um, and, and uh, what the coverage should look like. That was one year where we handed a, a, a camera to someone who got on the, the tour bus. Was it Lance? It was Lance's tour bus. It was his last year. Mm -hmm. And um, on his return. And they had a camera. And so we kept rolling footage of things that were coming out of the actual tour bus. Mm -hmm. You know, the team meeting. What does that look like? Yeah. What are these guys eating? How do they sit around? What's their faces really look like? You know, what is Ekimov? How does he, is he telling jokes to the guys or is he stoic sitting over in the corner? Yeah. We need to break those barriers down. I want to get to know them. Right. And so that was one of the things that we did that year. And I think it was really a terrific, terrific yeah. way to do it. Yeah, being on a team bus, you learn so much about the <laughs> dynamic of a team. It's amazing. But you're right, you, we really miss that stuff in, in the U.S. And we're starting to see it more in Europe. I, I think we see it more on Eurosport and things like that. But, uh, yeah, with the with the advent of live coverage, and now it's it's possible to do six hours, and people think that we should because we can, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe we had it right back in back in the 80s. Well, we had it partially right, and I think there's a place for both those. I say put that stuff online, yeah. do the live feed, get a couple of guys sit in a booth, have them call the live feed from European television. They're going to feed it anyway. Yeah. It exists. Or from the Vuelta or from the Tour of Italy, it exists. Just buy uh, access to the live feed. That's all you need to do. Bingo. But here's what I advocate. I advocate that we do the kind of coverage that we did back then. We go find stories. What's our story today? Yeah. Where are we going to go with this thing? And I don't mean what do these guys eat and let's go to the feed zone, but darn it, we should be in the feed zone at some point or another. And we should really see that that thing that was packed by that guy that morning is going into his stomach, you know, 110K into a 240K race. Yeah. And that that's a part of a bigger story. That's not the story of the day. The day is about racing. But there's not sidebars, but pieces that are embedded that help you tell the story of what this extraordinary competitive sport's about. I don't say we blow off the hardcore, you know, gear guys, but that we add and supplement to that world and we attract more people into our sphere. If we don't, then we're never going to grow this sport. Last question. What about... Uh the technology on the bike. We hear a lot about race radios, power meters that may be making the sport more boring. Uh, you know, we the, the major teams like Sky can now just shut down these breakaways and stuff like that. Would you like to see those removed? Would you, would you advocate for a race radio free racing environment? Did you see a change when it, you know, when it, when race radios became popular commonplace in the peloton could you i want to go back to something that you said and take it up to a hundred thousand feet <laughs> rather than answer your question which is at ground zero yeah. and that is making the sport more interesting and less boring yeah. okay that's where i want to go so if i'm sitting there with a clean slate i want to revisit the way we show the sport, the way the sport is performed, how the teams, the teams are all corporate. Yeah. There's no nationalities really that are connected to the sport. Back in my day, 
you know, I even hate saying that, you know, it was the Soviets versus the Colombians versus the Mexicans yeah. and the East Germans would come here. And then there would be the American 7-Eleven team, the dominant yeah. American team. I love the pro-am competition between the two so that we could have those exist. To me, the best way this sport could exist, and it's going to not be this way, but the best way would be if we could have nationalities reconnected because we are a nationalistic breed. We love to connect to our heritage. I got a little Dutch in me. I got a little Russian in me. Yeah, I want to see those guys win. Yeah, the Colombians come up here and they get beaten up every year. But how do you do that when your team is named after, you know, after something in Kazakhstan? Yeah. Yeah. You don't know how to identify with it. There's no human there. We don't get to see their faces. There's no baseball cards with, you know, their record on it. And now we've got overlaying that all of these other issues that have to do with drugs and that kind of competition. I really would get back to the nuggets, to the to the Peter Sagan, Davis Finney personality and somehow revisit how we can make the sport, you know, more competitive, more accessible, more available, more interesting, better TV coverage better live race announcing on in-house so that everyone that stands on the roadway between point A and B can pick up the device that they have on there, their little communicator called a cell phone, and hit a button and go to a place where they can listen to race radio coming out of a lead car that's about two miles up the road. So by the time they arrive with me, I have a vested interest in who's off the front. I know who's attacking. I know what the race results were from yesterday and who could take over today's lead, who the leader on the road is today. I'm now excited. You've now engaged me rather than a bunch of air blowing by me with what is a cool group of colorful racers that I'm going to take shots of on my cell phone, put up an Instagram and go home. And I'm not engaged and I'm not returning and I'm not a fan of the sport. That's where I go to your question of how do we make this sport more exciting? So if you said to me that everyone, it would be more exciting if everyone drugged or if everyone was on electric bikes, you know, we would sit and take a look at that and see if it's healthy and right and probably conclude not. How else could we do that? And I would be real interested in making it happen. But I have a list of 15 things that race promoters could do to make their races far more interesting and exciting and engaging for people to be connected to. And that's the stuff I'm much more interested in, how to make it better on TV, how to get more sponsors in the sport, how to connect those sponsors in a way that is meaningful to helping them lift sales in their company or solve the mission of whatever it is that brought them to the sport to begin with. Those are the kinds of things I really would much rather focus my time on. And much of it goes back to our TV coverage, which I think needs needs a lot of help. Well, I think you're the, you're the man for the job. We'll, uh, <laughs> uh, ho- hopefully Thanks. they'll uh, they'll reach out. But um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it's amazing that the drastic change that we've seen in, in television coverage in, in cycling. It, right. It's fascinating to me to go back and right. and look at the way that we covered the Coors Classic, and then look at the way that we cover. A race like Tour of California now, it's night and day. I mean, right. you, you would think it's two different sports. Uh, and I want to say this about that, because I think it's really important in closing, and that is that the coverage that they do of the Tour de France, the way they do it, for me, gets an A-. minus. And I'm only giving them the minus because I just don't give out A's very much. <laughs> I mean, it could be great. Yeah. Is it what I want for the sport? No. Yeah. Is it what they're doing is great? What they're doing for the sport is great. Their desk talent right now is awesome. Bob Roll has never been better. Yeah. The, the the producers of the sport are through the roof awesome. The stuff that they're doing, Joel and David, there's nobody better in the sport doing what they're doing with it. It's just not what I would do. I would take it to prime time. I would call it reality sports and I would develop sports stories every single day. Now, is it tough? It's much tougher than what they're doing. It's backbreaking to do that kind of turnaround. I get it. I'm a TV guy. I can understand that. So they would have to sit down and say, hey, you know, these are all great ideas, but the logistics of doing what you're talking about are monumental. But I want to visit that as a question rather than say we're not doing it anymore. I think we should be in prime time, not buried on a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. 
All right, get get uh, David Michaels on the phone. Call him up right I now. I do it all the time. Every this, time I go to California, I sit with a guy because I love him more than anybody in the world. Yeah, they're doing some amazing stuff. Yeah. Michael, thanks for taking the time. Man. You bet. I really appreciate it. You bet. This is so fun. From Boulder, Colorado, this was Michael Eisner on Laser Radio, uh, part two. Thanks for taking the time. Cheers. This has been another episode of Laser Radio. Be sure to check out more great shows on the Wide Angle Podium Network. Until next time, I'm Brad Soner saying thanks for listening.